And now I keep this pressed right between the fingers and the thumb and I grab the side. And now they're all my bookmarks and I only care about that bottom one. Hey YouTube, you're gonna have to bear with me because this is gonna go big and then it's gonna go small and then it's gonna go big again. Magic as a human endeavor is really, really difficult to define and categorize, partially because the only way that we can do that is to relate it to things that people already know. We try to relate magic to art or to craftsmanship or to science, and the truth is magic is a little bit of all of those things and yet contained by none of them, even if you combine all three. All of these extended metaphors tend to fall apart if you dive even just a couple inches below the surface. And one of the major reasons for that is because unlike all of those other things, unlike almost every other human endeavor, magic is built on secrecy. And that secrecy isn't really a bad thing inherently. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we can build magic up into something that wouldn't otherwise be if we had to explain everything we were doing step by step along the way. Imagine going to a play and every five minutes all the actors on stage went, just kidding, we're not these people that we're pretending to be, we're all just actors. It would kind of ruin the play. But just like every other thing that is inherently neutral in life, secrecy can have disadvantages too. And one of them, as far as magic is concerned, is called the problem of provenance. To keep it short, the problem of provenance is when it is very difficult, if not almost impossible, to trace the origins of the ideas that matter to a particular area of interest. So if we were talking about magic and the fact that it's built on secrecy, it means that either on purpose or on accident, it can be very difficult to trace the origins of things like slights or routines or themes inside of magic itself. If it's on purpose, right? If the origins of particular things that we do are being obscured, on one level, I kind of get that. Because when you first get started in magic, you make a soft agreement with the rest of the magic world that you promise to keep its secrets away from the outside world. The only time that that purposeful secrecy ever becomes an issue is when it turns inward, when magicians start keeping secrets from other magicians. It's understandable. Say there's a magician that comes up with a number of original ideas in magic, a number of routines and slights and whatever, and they don't want to share it with the rest of the magic world because that is a professional hazard. Well, no matter what, that story has a bad ending because there isn't a single human endeavor that ever thrived under internal secrecy. It just doesn't happen. Eventually entropy kicks in, and when that generation passes away, those ideas left unshared will fall on the ash heap of history. And the only way that they ever crop up again is when future generations rediscover those ideas for themselves, at which point they will very rightly call those ideas their own because they didn't get it from anyone in the past. And the problem of provenance marches on. If it's on accident, it's usually due to a lack of resources, a lack of access to those resources, or a lack of knowledge about what resources you already have access to. Some resources just don't stand the test of time. The booklets fall apart, the notes fade, and the authors fall into obscurity. Sometimes you just flat out can't access the resources that did stand the test of time because you can't afford to buy all of them and put them in front of you, or they aren't made available to you in a format that you can easily get to. If it's a lack of knowledge about what resources are available to you, let alone what's relevant to your particular area of inquiry, this is probably the most understandable problem in the modern world. We live in a digital economy, and we've gotten pretty good about digitizing magic knowledge, past and present. But if you just started today, there's no way that any one person could absorb everything that's available to them, let alone what's being created on a daily basis, because just that alone is like drinking from a fire hose. And it's these factors that I think are perpetuating this problem of provenance, and why every generation is sort of constantly rediscovering ideas that were already explored and published by previous generations. And no one is immune to this, because you don't know what you don't know. It doesn't matter how talented, smart, original, or well-read you may think you are, no one has a defense against the unexplored resource. So, to prove my point, I'm going to show you how I made this mistake. And I'm going to do it by teaching you the very beginnings of something that I released to the magic world several years ago through a company called Lost Art Magic. It's called the BC Shuffle. I'll teach you the very first part of it, and then I'll leave Lost Art to teach you the rest of it. But I also want to show you that despite my ardent claims of originality, I promptly found out that at least one person in every generation that came before me, going back to the 1930s, had both explored and published this very same idea. Okay, so what is the BC Shuffle? Essentially, it's a very controllable form of the overhand shuffle. And it's not false, you are actually mixing the cards. But BC stands for breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel dropping breadcrumbs in the forest so they could use those breadcrumbs to find their way home. When you do the overhand shuffle, I imagine that you would be able to set breadcrumbs, little outcroppings during the shuffle that you could use as a memory for everything that happened during that shuffle. And then like those breadcrumbs, use them to find your way home to the important part of the deck. 
Grab a deck of cards. I'm gonna use the Erdnaze deck from Doc's Playing Cards because they're badasses and I love what they make. Okay, so if we're gonna do this BC Shuffle thing, I gotta kill a bad habit that I see a lot with overhand shuffles. It looks something like this. It's where you just let the cards fall from the fingertips into the bottom hand, but you don't control how or how many cards fall at any given point. So instead, I'm going to teach you how to control not only how many, but how the cards fall specifically. So what you're going to do is grab the deck by the short ends at the extreme corners, like this. And then you're going to bevel the deck. You're going to slant the deck in a way that allows this top side where your thumb is going to touch to extend. This widens it out and adds the advantage that you've got a lot more space to work with when you're trying to estimate how many cards you're pulling at any point. But the other thing that that bevel does is it allows the outcroppings that happen naturally when you're doing the overhand shuffle to fall in a much more controlled and controllable way. Okay, so the first thing that you learn to do is to cut the cards using the overhand shuffle position because it's a really good illustration of what the BC shuffle does. So you've got this deck, it's beveled, you're going to rest the cards from the base of the pinky, follow up along the middle of the middle finger until it rests against the top of the index finger like this, okay? And then the thumb is actually just going to rest itself on top of the side of the deck, however far you need it to be in order to pull off however many cards you're looking to pull. So if we're going to do half the deck to do a cut, I'm going to let my thumb rest about halfway in to that beveled side of the deck. And then as I lift the cards, I peel about half the deck away. And this is the very controlled version of the overhand shuffle. Now what happens next is very important. What you're going to do is take this beveled part of the deck, lower this bottom part of the deck and let that bevel rest against parallel to the top of the deck. And then you let it ride until it hits your hand. And then all I'm going to do is let go. And you'll see because the bevel rested against the deck and then was collapsed, it forced a bunch of cards out the side of the deck. And you can see that here. So now this is my bookmark. This is my breadcrumb. If I can learn to control this, then I know where both the top and the bottom of the deck are. So if I wanted to cut the deck at this point, I could literally just grab the deck on the short end here and that doesn't push in the cards all the way, right? It actually keeps the other side open. And I could either cut with this hand or I could do a two hand cut where I just press down and I lift and then cut. And now the deck is back where it originally started. Second thing, you start extending this controlled version of the overhand shuffle. So you've got this part here beveled. You've got it rested against the base of the pinky all the way up, touches the first index finger. And now all I want you to do is just pull small packets using your thumb and your thumb comes in and just pulls at various levels. And pull big, pull small, but get practice pulling different amounts. Pull about half the deck and then pull small the rest of the time, pull very small, and then drop half the deck. Because both of those actions are going to be very important if you want to control either the top or the bottom of the deck. Okay, so then how does all this apply to the BC Shuffle? Well, you essentially combine the action of the first thing in the middle of doing the second thing. So as you're doing these overhand shuffles, in the middle of it, you're going to toss in a single bookmark. And the way that you do that is, let's say we want to control the two of spades. As I'm doing this shuffle, I pull heavy on the first one, right? I'm going to essentially cut the deck in half. And then on the next one, I'm going to let this bevel rest along the deck as I come in. And then I'm going to press in with my thumb as I peel a certain number of cards and I let that outcropping happen. And that is my bookmark. And now everything that happens after that, I don't really care about as long as I can maintain that bookmark. So what I don't do is turn my hand because that might cause it to fall in, especially on a newer deck. So I leave my hand tilted like this. And then I just shuffle normal. And now I keep this pressed right between the fingers and the thumb and I grab the side. And now they're all my bookmarks and I only care about that bottom one so when I go to cut, I make sure that I reach all the way to the bottom and I lift by pressing down with my first finger and I lift with my thumb at that bottom bookmark. And then when I cut the deck, there's my two. Okay, so what if I wanted to control the bottom of the deck? Well, in this case, I've got the three of hearts. The only difference in action is the number of cards that I'm pulling with my thumb as I'm doing the overhand shuffle. So instead of pulling heavy, I'm going to pull light until I get ready to do the final drop. So 
I pull light, pull light, pull light, pull light, and then when I get a good number of cards that I could still throw and seem like it's natural to the shuffle, I'm going to set that bevel against the deck and then I'm just going to let go. And now, instead of the bottom bookmark being important to me, it's this top bookmark right here. So, as I go to cut the cards, instead of cutting all the way to the bottom, I feel for the very first outcropping that I can, I lift there, and if I did it right, that's my three of hearts. And as I cut, now I've controlled the bottom of the deck. And there you go. That is the beginnings of the BC Shuffle. And that one idea caused an obsession in me that lasted for over a year, where I researched every single form of overhand shuffle control that I could find. And while I did that, I came up with ways to control the entire order of the deck, to cut multiples of those bookmarks with one hand, to do all of it blind so you didn't have to look at your hands while you were doing it. But you should also know that after I created the final version of the project, which lasts for over an hour and a half, once I handed it in to Lost Art Magic, it was one week before I got smacked with the problem of provenance, and I found out that I am not as original as I thought. Okay, so here we go. First hit. <laughs> I released the BC Shuffle with Lost Art Magic somewhere around the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. And then a friend reaches out to me shortly after its release and goes, hey man, great job, but have you read Roberto Giobbi's Confidences? This book was printed back in 2012. It's an exploration of a number of different areas of magic, and because it didn't specialize on cards, I didn't reference it during my research. And sure enough, right on page 93, he has something called the face-up overhand shuffle control, where he goes over the idea of the outcroppings off the side of the deck of those cards during the overhand shuffle and using them to control the shuffle. Son of a Oh, but don't you worry, because the hits keep coming. So I get beat to publishing the origins of this idea by Roberto Giobbi by roughly three to four years, which stings, but I get over it because Roberto Giobbi is one of the greats. He is one of the most prolific and well-educated writers on card magic, let alone magic in general. So a month goes by. My wounds have healed. I've realized that the famous Mr. Giobbi is not going to send the Magic Mafia to kill me for theft. And then another friend who had watched my project goes, hey, Jeremy, great project. By the way, have you heard of the Jennings Jog Shuffle? And I thought, oh no, what the hell is the Jennings Jog Shuffle? And he goes, you can find it in a book called Jennings 67. This book was printed back in 1997, but it ostensibly goes over the work of Jennings from about 30 years earlier. Sure enough, on page 22, under the Monarchs Quartet, he goes over utilizing outcroppings of an overhand shuffle to find your way to the important part of the deck. That means that Jennings beat me to publishing this idea by not three to four years, but roughly 18 to 48 years. So I got beat by not one, but two of the great card men of generations that came before me, and by roughly half a century. Which sucks, but again, I get over it. I settle into a comfortable existence for the next four years. I get married, I have some kids, I travel the world, I get to meet some of the best card men, and one of them is a guy named Eddie McCall. You're actually going to meet Eddie on this channel next week, but before I knew him in person, I knew his work. Someone had mentioned that he was really good with a deck of cards, so I found his website, I loved what I saw, and I downloaded everything. So by the time I got to meet him at the Blackpool Magic Convention in 2020, I knew what I was in for, and I got to watch him work for an hour and a half, asking him questions, talking about subtleties, and it was great. We ended up becoming friends. And when the whole world lit on fire and went into lockdown during 2020, he and I stayed in touch. And to show my appreciation for everything that I had learned from him, I gave him everything that I'd created up to that point, including the BC Shuffle. And sure enough, I get a call from Eddie going, hey, Jeremy, love the project. By the way, have you heard of a guy named Albert Verity? And I thought, oh no. There's a book out there that you will likely only ever find in digital format because it was originally written back in 1937. It's a book called Magic of the Hands. It was written and compiled by a guy named Edward Victor. And he and a number of people that he asked to contribute to it collected all of these ideas about how sleight of hand applied to different things like cards, coins, balls, silks, ropes, a whole bunch of it. And one of those contributors is a guy named Albert Verity. And right in the very beginning of this book, he goes over something that he calls a substitute for the in-jog. In-jogs and out-jogs, the way that cards stick out both the front and the back of the short ends of the deck is a pretty standard way of controlling cards when you're doing an overhand shuffle. It was made most prominent back in 1902 by a guy named S.W. Ordinaise in a tiny little book called Expert at the Card Table. Little book, no one's ever read it, no big deal. Anyway. Verity was the first guy to publish the idea that the cards didn't have to stick out the front or the back of the deck as you were doing the shuffle in order to control the cards. They could stick out the top, which is pretty revolutionary because that's where cards would crop out anyway, which makes this move really subtle. 
So I've now been beaten to this idea by two greats and one mystery man from 1937. So who the hell is Albert Verity? I wish I could tell you more about this guy, but honestly, I don't know much about him. Based on my research, the only things that I could find were the things that he had contributed to and a small article that they did on him in a British magic magazine back in 1962. That magazine was called The Gen, and the article even begins with, we don't know much about Albert Verity, so we had to ask his friend in order to gain any info. That friend was a guy named Ken Brook and he paints a pretty cool picture of Albert. We know that he got interested in magic when he was very young, because Albert hand copied down the entire text of Expert at the Card Table because he couldn't afford to buy his own copy. Incidentally, the book that he borrowed was from a guy named Howard Seed, who on occasion was a prop builder for Harry Houdini. We know that from those humble beginnings, he ended up becoming one of the most talented magicians of his generation. He started his own magic company, released a number of his own creations, and if ever there was a dispute about who it was that originally came up with a particular idea, he was the first one to hand credit over to them, because as Ken put it, he valued friendship over notoriety. There's a pretty cool anecdote about him that relates to a guy named Walter Jeans, a prolific magician and inventor during the 1920s who challenged the entire magic world to compete against him in sleight of hand, with one exception he would not compete against Albert Verity. And that's it, that's kind of where the biography ends. The only other stuff that I could find about him were the small contributions that he made to the works of his friends, which again only speaks to the way that he valued friendship over notoriety. And if that's the only thing that I knew about him, that would be enough for me to say that I got beat to this idea by three grades, not two. And there you go. That is the official history of the BC Shuffle, this tiny little outcropping of cards that starts with Albert Verity all the way back in 1937, and for over 80 years and three generations finally lands in my lap somewhere around 2015. And I get so excited by this idea, I create an hour and a half download because I think all these ideas are my own. But there's a very important detail that I want you to remember about all of this, and if it's the only thing you take away, I hope you remember it. Until it got to me, every generation that had written about this idea gave it a page and a half. It got to me and I got so excited I did an hour and a half download. Which means that maybe, just maybe, the point shouldn't be to chase originality, but to chase curiosity. Now, was I guilty for not crediting properly the generations that came before me who had already explored this idea before I got to it? Yes. And I only help perpetuate that problem of provenance that we talked about in the beginning. But I was as much a victim of it as I was a perpetrator. Because like every other human walking the planet, I didn't know what I didn't know. In a couple of instances, I had no idea that these references existed, let alone that they were relevant to the thing that I cared about. So please remember this. If there's something in magic that you care about, some idea that you want to explore, please, by all means, to the best of your ability, explore its history. Look up all of the people and things that have contributed to that idea. But then, once you're done doing that, do something which is likely more important. Start exploring its future. Because if the past had the final say on every idea that mattered to the future, the world would stop spinning fairly quickly. So by all means, do your homework. And then once you're done doing that, write some goddamn poetry. Because as it turns out, that might be the more important endeavor. You might actually have something unique to say about that thing you care about oh so much that the world has yet to hear. And by God, I hope you get the chance to say it. And until then, I'll see you guys soon.